Thank you very much for the invitation to speak uh, here today. Uh, this is a very important area of clinical work as well as research. And um, what I did was rather than giving uh, cases, I am giving different areas of GI malignancy covering uh, everything from the esophagus and stomach um, downward with a little bit of side um, portions of the pancreas and the liver and then uh, onto the colon. So join me, and I really appreciate everybody staying for this. Interestingly, I started speaking, public speaking, um, when I was in elementary school. Understand I'm number five of seven kids. So numbers one, three, or four were telling me what to do, how to fix your hair, how to, what clothes are you going to wear? And we were very privileged to um, live in a multi-generational household. And my great-grandmother, who was in her 80s, said, honey, don't let them get you upset. Don't worry about it. Your mom fixes your hair. You've got good clothes. But what you've got to do is make sure you're not last on the list to speak and that people in the audience are not hungry. So what do I have today? I'm last on the list for the morning program. I am keeping you between lunch and speaking. So please bear with me, and I'll try to make it worth your while. And Granny, please forgive me. I didn't do what you told me to do. So I'm going to talk about uh, how we've had improved survival over the years in gastrointestinal cancers. So this was a study that was presented uh, regarding what do you do after patients have standard treatment? So we all know the oxaliplatin regimens, the irinotecan regimens, um, with or without bevacizumab and others. We also know that uh, this was started some years ago with 5-FU. Uh, and 5-FU is still the most frequently used drug in the treatment of colorectal cancer. It, of course, has been added to other uh, treatments. But what do you do after the patient has treated, has received a 5-FU, an oxaliplatin, and an irinotecan regimen? Uh, it is also recognized that if you use bevacizumab in treatment number one or two, uh, that bevacizumab can be added again to chemotherapy and subsequent regimens. So in this um, study of trifluoridine tipracil plus bevacizumab for third-line treatment, of refractory metastatic colorectal cancer. So this is colorectal cancer that has been treated with two regimen and now for third line uh, treatment. It was a phase three randomized study. And the rationale for this is that um, the oral drug, uh, the combination of uh, trifluoridine which is a thymidine-based uh, antineoplastic agent. Uh, many people say it's 5-FU-like, but it's actually different. Uh, and then it's combined with tipracil, which is a thymidine phosphorylase inhibitor that increases the bioavailability of trifluoridine. Uh, there have been studies to show that 
This drug as a single agent is important and especially as a third line treatment. So adding uh, bevacizumab uh, to that very important. And this is the um, regimen uh, and the study. Uh, it's an open, uh, open labeled uh, randomized phase three study in patients with refractory metastatic colon and rectal cancer. All of the patients, of course, had um, diagnosed disease and it was measurable. Uh, there was follow-up every eight weeks and it was um, this drug plus bevacizumab or the drug alone um, without bevacizumab. And this was the analysis showing the top line indicating that this um, overall survival was very important with the bevacizumab and consequently whether uh, measured uh, at overall survival at six months or 12 months or the overall, um, this combination had greater effectiveness. Uh, therefore, uh, this offers clinicians and others treating these patients, as well as uh, primary care and others who follow the patients as well uh, to help the patients uh, get through the treatment. There were no additional toxicities to adding bevacizumab to um, trifluoridine uh, tiprosil, uh, and these were the conclusions. Uh, that um, this drug plus bevacizumab resulted in significantly longer overall survival and progression-free survival and improved disease control uh, compared to the drug alone. Uh, the first, this is the first trial um, in this setting with this combination uh, that demonstrates improved survival, uh, overall survival, and then at six and 12 months. So during the duration of the study, this was really very important. Um, and it occurred in any subgroups, whether there were liver metastases, lung metastases, or uh, combinations of uh, those. So this is a very important uh, study and with the combination there was no uh, diminution of performance status. So it did not in, uh, increase uh, toxicities for the patients nor uh, did it make them uh, sicker. So this is a good safety uh, drug combination, very important. I have used this in a number of patients and have been able to get those patients uh, actually through even more than a year uh, of good uh, performance status with tumor, effective tumor control. So this is a combination uh, the oral agent did not increase, uh, uh, does not increase nausea, vomiting, or other um, GI symptoms. So it uh, has shown that with this study, this is a new standard and therefore uh, game changing in terms of healthcare, in terms of patient longevity. So. Good. Now, this is from the NRG Oncology, which is one of the NCI-supported cooperative groups. And this is in the treatment of rectal cancer. Many patients refuse treatment for rectal cancer 
in previous years when there was just irradiation with surg surgery. And in that, patients refused the surgery or even pre uh, refused all of the treatment because they did not want uh, a long-term uh, ostomy uh, for the rest of their lives. I even had one patient come in in the earlier years of what we call total neoadjuvant therapy, meaning we give the chemotherapy, the radiation, and then the surgery, uh, and some patients therefore did not require uh, long-term ostomies. But I had a patient who was referred to me for consultation, and he walked in and said to me, Ms. Mitchell, my doctor sent me to see you. I've been to lots of other doctors for more than six months, and everybody tells me I got to have a bag the rest of my life. And my doctor said to me that you were doing a study where uh, I might not need a bag. Uh, and uh, so patients are really very interested in that. It's also important for the primary care physician because patients come in with the complications of uh, chronic ostomy care. Uh, so uh, we started with chemotherapy as TNT, and this was an extension of that study from the NRG, which is one of the National Cancer Institute's um, cooperative groups. So uh, here, this is the recommendation, and several other agents have been added to the basic chemotherapy given uh, with irradiation and all prior to surgical intervention. And if there is significant um, dose response or a significant treatment response, then that facilitates the surgical interventions um, that can be utilized. Uh, so what this, stud, this part of the study was adding other agents to the chemotherapy regimen to see if we can gain additional benefit. So in this uh, level of the study, Viliparib and Pembrolizumab were added to the chemotherapy, and these are the results that you can see. While the curves do show a bit of difference, uh, the overall measurement did not add uh, benefit from Viliparib and Pembrolizumab. So these conclusions. Uh, the outcomes showed neither viliparib or pembrolizumab added to the total neoadjuvant uh, therapy, um, and there was some improvement for short course, uh, short term uh, outcomes in a few patients, but overall, uh, the overall survival of the um, addition did not add benefit. So <clears throat> that study continues, not with viliparib and pembrolizumab, but with other agents to be added at different levels. Uh, so again, showing the TNT with the chemotherapy is still the standard of treatment uh, with the treatment of lower rectal cancer, um, but the overall TNT from years ago did show benefit in terms of uh, the surgical interventions and in impact of surgical interventions. Now, this is a study that I want to talk about uh, in the treatment of gastric cancer or GE junction tumors. Uh, these tumors have shown over several years an increase in this country 
and an increase in disparate populations as well. The overall increase in African Americans and Latino patients, we don't know why, uh, but there has been an increase. Um, so this study, nivolumab plus chemotherapy versus chemotherapy as first-line treatment for advanced gastric uh, cancer and GE junction uh, cancers, as well as lower esophageal adenocarcinomas. So these are all adenocarcinomas, not the squamous cell carcinomas of the esophagus. Uh, and the study was uh, nivolumab, Zelox, uh, nivolumab, and Folfox in the treatment as opposed to chemotherapy alone with either Zelox or Folfox. Hmm, this didn't move. Okay. Got to hit it a little harder. So these are the uh, overall survival graphs at 36 months. And note that the nivolumab uh, plus chemotherapy, um, there was a, splint, um, a separation of the curves early on, and that separation continued through the 36-month follow-up. So what does this show? It's been a three-year study and follow-up. Nevo and chemotherapy continue to dis, uh, demonstrate meaningful overall response rates and survival in gastric cancer, um, as well as the GE junction and adenocarcinoma of the distal esophagus. Uh, and this shows a new standard of treatment uh, for these cancers. Consequently, uh, this study uh, has opened a new treatment paradigm uh, for these patients, and uh, it did not add to the overall toxicity, nor did it... Um, offer any other consequences of addition to the therapy. So this is a new treatment now that has become the standard uh, treatment for these per patients. And this is first line. Um, it is not after treatment of, with other drugs. So this is a new standard for treatment of distal esophagus uh, GE junction, and gastric adenocarcinomas. Um, new changes. Okay, here we go. So for many years, there was no standard treatment for um, carcinomas of the biliary tract. Uh, 5-FU was the standard for many years, and a few years ago, cisplatin uh, plus um, gemcitabine or 5-FU were offered as the standard. And in that study, um, gemcitabine and cisplatin became the new uh, standard for treatment of biliary tract cancers and still continues. So this was a study by the Southwestern Oncology Group, uh, again, a uh, funded cancer cooperative group from the National Cancer Institute. And this was a randomized trial of gemcitabine and cisplatin uh, with the addition of nabpaclitaxel um, to the regimen. Uh, and that was compared to the standard gemcitabine and cisplatin in newly diagnosed advanced biliary tract cancers. And this was the design. Uh, patients were evaluated. All had um, pathology 
that was measured and consequently the addition of NABPAC Letaxel to the standard um, gemcitabine and cisplatin. And here you see the curves, no difference in either um, progression-free survival or overall survival. And while NABPAC Letaxel has been utilized in pancreatic cancer, it was thought that adding it to the standard might offer benefit. There was also increased toxicity, adding NABPAC Letaxel to the regimen, and that toxicity included nausea, vomiting, fatigue, as well as the hematological uh, effects from the treatment. So in conclusion, the addition of NABPAC Letaxel, while it was very important in pancreatic cancer, uh, adding this to the standard gemcitabine and cisplatin did not improve overall survival in these patients with biliary tract cancers. And the overall survival was actually um, higher in the group without the paclitaxel, probably because of the effects of therapy and toxicities such that uh, patient-derived treatments were interrupted. Uh, so do not add nab paclitaxel to the standard gemcitabine and cisplatin for patients with biliary tract cancers. Uh, the next is the uh, NAPALI trial, which is a randomized phase three study of liposomal irinotecan, 5-FU and leucovorin, uh, plus oxaliplatin versus NAB-paclitaxel plus gemcitabine, uh, which I've mentioned before, in the treatment of first-line patients with metastatic uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. Uh, so uh, NAB-paclitaxel is a standard uh, treatment for uh, pancreatic cancer, but also uh, there is the combination therapy of irinotecan, oxaliplatin, 5-FU, leucovorin, in pancreatic cancer patients as first line. Uh, so with this study, uh, liposomal irinotecan uh, is thought to reach the tumor faster and remain in the tumor uh, for longer periods of time because it is liposomal and therefore the fat in the um, liposome uh, is thought to keep the drug available for longer periods of time. So for this study, uh, as I mentioned, the liposomal irinotecan in one uh, arm of the study and the standard NAB-paclitaxel uh, in the other uh, arm. Now, you say why uh, use the liposomal irinotecan because we can give IV irinotecan, uh, but liposomal irinotecan remains in the tumor for longer periods of time and is thought to have greater effectiveness, but also it decreases the toxicity uh, experienced by patients when compared to uh, fulfirinox with uh, um, irinotecan and oxaliplatin with 5-FU leucovorin. So this is the design. And here you see uh, the curves splay early and remain different throughout the follow-up time of the study. Uh, and therefore, uh, this study showed that liposomal irinotecan in combination with 5-FU and oxaliplatin demonstrated clinically uh, meaningful statistically 
significant improvement in overall survival, and this continued throughout the study. Uh, and therefore, what we have is a new acceptable treatment for first-line pancreatic cancer, and that is adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. And therefore, it's another option for uh, treating patients with first-line treatment of adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. And for all of the various combinations of patients and delineation of patient differences, this was effective for all lines of uh, treatment and for all groups of patients. So now we have another combination that is um, an opportunity for patients with adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. So another study. So the next uh, idea that I want to present is that of postoperative circulating um, DNA, that's ctDNA, uh, and its impact on um, minimal residual disease detection rates in patients with resected stage one through three carcinoma. Now this is uh, an area of extensive study. And I can tell you, I hear from a new company almost every week on um, testing for ctDNA. And um, my nurses actually went through with me um, where we were counting the number. And we counted 26 different companies uh, recommending these um, measures. Now, the measures do not have to have approval from the FDA or any other body. Um, and you've heard of one company recently where the president is now in jail uh, because of a lack of effectiveness that was demonstrated in uh, the legal uh, findings. So you may have people coming to your office all the time. And there have been several um, groups evaluating the number of tests, the kind of test, when do you test, uh, do you test all patients who have received surgical resection of colorectal cancer, and now it's actually moving into um, pancreatic cancers, stomach cancers, liver cancers, and others. So I think these um, discussions and testing are very important. Uh, so this was um, after patients with surgery uh, treated colorectal cancer. And as you can see, those with early stage disease, stage one, or with late stage disease, stage three. Um, so the background, as I said, this has emerged as a strong prognostic and predictive biomarker, uh, especially in colorectal cancer. Uh, the sequences uh, allows us to understand um, and collect data over long periods of time on um, the cell-free um, DNA. Uh, in some situations, it's used right after surgery. In other situations, in patients with um, metastatic disease, it's used to follow the patients, and it is thought to actually show benefit prior to the scans, uh, CEA, and other measures used to follow uh, these patients. So here, um, the conclusions from this study. One is um, the uh, cellular uh, or cytological DNA concentration is increased immediately during the first two weeks after surgery. We don't know if that is uh, the immune system 
or just whether there are cells released during the uh, surgical procedure, but the first two weeks, it's high. And then it begins to decrease so that by the fourth week, um, there is stabilization. In those patients with high concentrations, after four w weeks, uh, that was found in the group of patients with earlier uh, tumor recurrence. So very important. Um, so um, during the first two weeks after surgery, uh, an elevated level did not correlate with any um, unusual survival or in the development of metastatic disease. Um, after four weeks, that's very important. If the level remains high or continues to increase, after four weeks uh, following the surgical procedure, uh, that can be a good indicator of recurrent disease. Or if it occurs even a year after um, the surgical procedure, uh, that would be important. In patients with metastatic disease on chemotherapy or treated by other modalities, um, that is an indicator of uh, either progressive disease or recurrent disease. So what do we mean by that? Let's say if there was a patient who had been operated on, developed a single nodule in the liver, and that was treated by radiology. Um, again, if the levels drop after four weeks, that means that that procedure was effective. And if there is subsequent elevation of the ctDNA, uh, that what meant that there was progressive disease some, someplace. And this could occur uh, prior to the demonstration of radiologic uh, pr disease progression. So very important to um, know how to follow these patients. Now the question is, the questions are, I should say, how frequently do you have to measure the ctDNA? Nobody knows. Uh, how um, long do you follow ctDNA after treatment, whether that's surgical treatment or effective uh, chemotherapy or whatever? Again, not known, uh, but we do know there is some benefit. So following this presentation, there was another presentation, uh, circulating tumor DNA, prime time or jumping too soon. Um, and the results of that uh, discussion uh, ended with at least some guidelines for clinicians. So we'll discuss them. So detection of ctDNA after curative intense surgery predicts for higher risk of recurrence. So it's a prognostic factor. Uh, Post-op CTD and test, uh, testing can be helpful to guide adjuvant therapy, um, follow-up of patients, but again, we don't know the benefit, we don't know how long, we don't know how frequently to test. Um, and it can be used for stage two patients as well. And what that meant was that usually we don't give postoperative chemotherapy to stage two patients, but if the patient had a persistently high ctDNA, um, postoperative chemotherapy might be considered in um, those stage two patients. And I said, might be considered. This is not a definite. Uh, favorable relapse-free survival in treated patients who have had really good treatment and have a persistently high ctDNA clearance um, 
may suggest potential benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy in stage two patients. So if I had a stage two patient and I was debating chemotherapy or not, uh, it's recognized that 85% of these patients don't need postoperative chemotherapy. But this might be one way of defining the 15 to 20% of patients who would need um, chemotherapy after surgery uh, as adju adjuvant treatment. And ctDNA detection post-chemotherapy or during chemotherapy is prognostic, but it, its clinical utility remains the subject of investigations. So while patients are on chemotherapy, if there is a persistently high uh, ctDNA level or increasing uh, that is felt to be uh, unresponsive or a lack of responsiveness to the uh, therapy. So more to come on ctDNA. Is it being utilized in the clinic? Yes. Patients know about it. Doctors know about it. Surgeons know about it. Oncologists know about it. And we are routinely using it in uh, selected patients. How frequently? Nobody can tell you. Uh, so with that, I think that's the last slide. And I am happy to answer your questions. So thank you for staying with me, even though this is the only thing between you and lunch. But Dr. I'm happy to answer any questions. Dr. Mitchell, thank you so much. We have a question from the audience. Are studies testing nalurifox against fulfirinox, which also seems to be a relevant comparison? Uh, there are studies but many feel that they are not necessary because of the toxicities of fulfirinox, uh, giving all of these drugs to the patient at one time. So consequently, um, many of us have gone to um, lipolyzed liposomal irinotecan, and I use it routinely um, and have for years in patients who had already gone through one or two treatments. So we would give them liposomal irinotecan. And interestingly, many people responded. So now, having this study, uh, there is the opportunity for liposomal irinotecan uh, with oxaliplatin uh, for those patients who um, either want less toxicity or who the physician wants to use this regimen. So it's another option. It's not the curative um, treatment that's going to cure adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, but it gives us another option for treating those patients um, and many of these patients already have significant symptoms from the cancer by the time they get to um, cancer care. So um, most patients with adenocarcinoma of the pancreas come to us with significant either pain, weight loss, nausea, vomiting, um, lack of appetite. So they arrive with uh, challenges before we even have the diagnosis. And then one more question, just in the spirit of we've been talking so much about diversity and you're such a trailblazer over the last decades. How do you approach um, patients of color in terms of risk, in terms of outcomes? How do you approach conversations with them so that they, they see that there's a difference between the statistics we're seeing across the board and the statistics in their lived experience? Great question, thank you. So for many people, the general understanding of pancreatic cancer is that it's deadly, uh, is that patients suffer, and therefore 
uh, why enter a clinical trial, why even get treatment. So that is the attitude of many patients when they arrive for uh, recommendations. And what I try to do is explain to the patient uh, what the clinical trials have shown. But I also, on the day that I see the patient and order diagnostic tests, you know, CT scans and MRIs and so forth, I give the patient recommendations for palliative care, and that means starting with diet, um, dietary recommendations, foods, um, to help the patients understand how important nutrition uh, is as a part of pancreatic cancer uh, therapy. We also look at the social determinants of health. Uh, it's well recognized that African Americans, um, some Native Americans, and others, Alaskan Natives, have um, higher mortality rates from um, adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. I also try to get our medical um, multidisciplinary team to see the patient. And once I get information on whether the patient has metastatic disease or unresectable disease, I try to have um, the palliative care group involved. And if it looks like the patient may have a surgically resectable disease or amenable to some surgical intervention, um, I immediately call uh, the appropriate surgeons um, so that we can get the whole team working with the patient. So many times people talk about the lack of trust um, in um, minority patients. I look at it the other way, and that is it is the responsibility of the healthcare team and healthcare institutions to exhibit their trustworthiness. So it's not the patient's mistrust, it is the failure of healthcare delivery such that uh, we are seen as being trustworthy. So I say look at the team. Uh, team, look at yourselves. Are you reaching the communities around you so that you may get these patients in uh, earlier uh, for uh, treatment and intervention, diagnostic studies, and implementation? And use whatever resources you have to help the patients know your community, but exhibit your trustworthiness. Yes. Sorry, I have a question on the, the issue you raised about the ctDNA in the postoperative setting and the potential use for like stage two patients that otherwise might not get ke adjuvant chemo and then you may, may make a decision based on the postoperative ctDNA for potentially high risk patients. So, uh, you know, I think we're dealing with this issue in bladder cancer, which is much further behind than colon cancer in the development of tDNA after surgery, but I think it's a tantalizing question. I think, I think it's, it's tantalizing to, to think that it's that 15% that maybe tDNA will solve the issue for the 15% that will recur and just we didn't know. But do you, do you think that those ongoing studies will truly answer the question or that the field has just sailed too far and there's no turning back? Uh, because I think in, in this day and age, uh, you know, is it ethical, for instance, to randomize a patient to a study where the patient may know that the CTDNA is elevated and the patient will still be randomized to no chemo? Do you think that's ethical and do you think those current studies that are all doing this based on correlative science where the results may not be disclosed either to the investigators or to the patient. So yeah, we may get answers from that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the challenge in those studies is an example. So in, in practice, if you, for instance, had positive CTDNA in the post-op setting, you might be tempted 
knowing the results, it might be tempting, for instance, to get the PET CT and to see is there a liver lesion that we missed and let's go resect it. You're not gonna have that information in those blinded uh, studies that are just being done correlative because it was blinded. So it was not worked up further. So what are your thoughts on this? Do you think we're ever gonna have an answer if this is truly the answer for those 15% of patients or the, the, there's no turning back on this test? Sure, so the 15% would be the stage two patients who um, the standard is now no chemotherapy, but you know that they're going to be 15 to 20% of patients with stage two disease who will eventually develop metastatic disease. So the question is, how do you find those people earlier? Now, regarding uh, randomized trials, this is an area where, I don't know, I say we will never do a randomized trial because one, the patients want to know. Two, the doctors and clinicians and staff want to know. Uh, there's no standard on how it's to be used. So if there was a randomized control trial, we would not know uh, the times of measurements and um, the comparable uh, clinical part. So in my, also, you've got all these companies contacting you, use my product, use my product, use my product, and offering um, testing even if I have the patient on a testing schedule with one company, um, they will give me some free um, testing. So you've got so many factors um, affiliated and no national guidelines um, for utility. I don't think we'll ever get to a point where we recommend uh, a, a a phase three trial, for example. Now, what I do recommend is that we increase the genomic profiling of our tumors. And now we're seeing more patients uh, who have not Lynch's syndrome because it's not uh, genomic or genetic, but we find uh, patients who I follow for colon cancer develop hematuria, uh, and with evaluation, we find a bladder cancer. Uh, so I think it's very important. I think every patient with colon cancer ought to have a genomic profile done and should have genetic uh, testing for stage two and three and for disease, because you never know when you will find a relationship, either Lynch's syndrome or um, other genetic processes, what they say is variable um, abnormality under, not understood. So that's what you get back. But it gives you the opportunities to follow these patients so I think that we should do a genetic analysis on stage two and higher. I think we should do genomic testing on every single colon cancer with stage two or higher, and thereby we can screen for other risk. Um, same thing is true with pancreatic cancer. Uh, we're finding a relationship between BRCA testing, breast cancer, and pancreatic cancer, so that you're able to help the patient and the family with decision making in these areas. But if you don't test, you won't find it. And some of the um, chemotherapy agents that we use in the treatment of breast cancer, guess what? If the pancreatic cancer is BRCA positive, we can uh, obtain drug through insurance companies. 
So we've got to fight for our patients, and we've got to understand and learn. Um, so I'm a big proponent of testing. I use the um, CTDNA after uh, surgical resection for stage two or higher um, colon cancer. I use it for treating patients with metastatic disease. Are we ready to eat? I'll be around so that if there are questions, I'm happy to address them. Thank you for your time. Okay. All right, thank you all so much. We'll now have a break for lunch, so please head out to the exhibitor area and grab some food and I hope you all enjoy.